Welcome to La Trobe University in Melbourne. My name is Jan Liebig and I'm privileged to have Dr. Andrew Lee. Welcome Andrew, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Uh, most people uh, see you now as a politician uh, due to your seat uh, in the Australian House of Representatives for, for the Labour Party. But it should be mentioned that you uh, were actually previously an economics professor at the Australian National University and um, I think one of the most prolific uh, economics researchers. So uh, what we're going to be doing today, we're going to try to merge your expertise in both economics and, and, and politics and we're going to focus on an economic policy. And, and specifically, we're interested in how academic research can actually contribute to uh, policy design and improve policy outcomes. So let's start with education. In uh, one of your papers, I think 2006, with Chris Ryan, you're looking at the, at the quality of, of school teachers in Australia. And you find uh, a, a downward trend. You find a decline in the, in the quality of the teachers. And then you look at the various uh, tri possible explanations and you come up with teachers pay as one of the variables. Mm. So can you tell us what, what teachers pay has, ha what happened to teachers pay over time and how it may uh, link to uh, teachers quality? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the story of the academic aptitude of new teachers is that in 1983, the typical teacher was at the 70th percentile of the aptitude distribution uh, in the top 30% of her class. By 2003, she was at the 62nd percentile, the top 38% of her class. And Chris and I talk about a, a number of possible explanations, but one is this uh, trade-off that policymakers made uh, from the late 1980s to the early 2000s uh, between cutting class sizes but not increasing the overall salary budget uh, commensurately. So roughly you saw a 10% cut in teacher pay relative to other occupations and a 10% cut in class size. So it's almost like the new teachers uh, were being paid out of the wallets of the existing teachers. And then you had some other factors going on. You had the uh, fact that uh, gender pay discrimination in the professions was rampant in the 1950s and 1960s. So it was mm. almost like we were corralling Australia's mm. most talented women uh, into teaching and nursing. And as those gender pay gaps uh, fell, uh, we then saw a, a drop off in the share of super talented women entering teaching. Mm. And thirdly, I think there's also a uh, an increase in earnings inequality in the rest of the labour market, uh, which posed a particular challenge for teaching, which is traditionally operated off uniform salary schedules. Mm. So let's think of, of the consequences. You have mm. a, a 2009 paper where you're actually looking at the, the student outcomes. So you look at the, at the um, numeracy and literacy scores for Australian school children. And, and you find a, a worrying trend. You find that there has been a decline in the, in the scores. Uh, and, and given the, the, the increases in, in, the, in the expenditure per student, mm. it, it would kind of, at face value, it would imply a, a fall in school productivity. So, so can you tell us a little bit about that and maybe how that actually links to your previous study about lowering teachers' pay? Yes, uh, yes. And it's, uh, school productivity is one of these ugly phrases that economists love and policy maker, educational policymakers hate. Uh, but essentially what you've described is, is the trend we found. Uh, we went back through the dusty archives to try and find uh, instances in which precisely the same qu uh, maths or English question had been asked of successive cohorts. And so same mm. wording, a uh, certain share of kids get it right in one uh, test, another share of kids get it right in another test. And we find uh, flat or perhaps even declining test scores uh, across a couple of different, different tests. Um, one possibility is that that uh, trade-off between uh, dropping teacher pay relative to prof other professionals and cutting class sizes was actually the, the wrong trade-off to be making in that period. Uh, and then there's other possibilities such as you know, potentially uh, changes in uh, curriculum uh, affecting outcomes. Mm. There's also a set of social changes but to the extent that Chris and I can hold them constant. It doesn't look as though things like more TV watching or uh, a rise in single parent households, a uh, rise in uh, kids from non-English speaking backgrounds explains much mm. of it. And mm. you've actually got trends that go in the opposite direction, not just the spending, but also the fact that more kids than ever before have a parent 
uh, with a tertiary education. Mm. Uh, so it's a bit of a black box. We can tell that Australia's school kids in year eight or nine aren't scoring mm. better than they did a generation ago. And I think that poses a, a pretty big challenge for mm. policymakers uh, like me. Well, the, I mean, if you combine the two findings, it kind of seems like a no-brainer. You, you have lower teachers pay, you've got lower quality teachers, and then you have uh, worse student outcomes. But you're suggesting that that might be too simplistic, that it may not explain the whole story. I certainly think that teacher quality is important. Uh, you, one of the things that always surprises me is that parents worry a huge amount about which school their child attends, uh, yet they worry very little about which teacher their child is taught by within a school. Uh, and yet we know that the within school variance is higher than the between school variance. Um, so I think that does suggest that, uh, that we ought to be focusing on teacher quality. Uh, I think programs such as Teach for Australia and Teach Next are important mm. in uh, attracting alternative career entry. Uh, I think it's really also important to think about retention of great teachers in the, in the profession uh, and, uh, and that's, that's a key issue for policymakers. Mm. It's not the only one test score accountability, uh, princi principal, uh, uh, the, the right level of principal autonomy matters as well, but teacher quality mm. is pretty much my number one educational issue. Okay, so this, this would be some of the policies to try to reverse this trend. You mentioned class size. Does, does that matter so much, as, as much as it was believed? Uh, uh, certainly, uh, we know that cutting class sizes down from 40 to 30 has a big impact on student outcomes. Uh, cutting class sizes once they fall below 30 uh, probably has smaller impacts. Uh, the research is varied. You have uh, Tennessee Project Star suggesting still positive effects from going from 22 down to 18. But I think now you're probably down to a point where you want to think uh, about teacher quality and teacher pay uh, mm. as being the top priority. Okay. The, um, one of the critiques of, of the approach, and that's not just the Labour Party's approach, that's a, an approach across the globe, is, is more of a kind of top-down top approach where uh, the politicians kind of have an idea of what the education system mm. should look like and they try to impose it. And, uh, and a lot of critique uh, uh, is, is, is around kind of school autonomy. And th th there is some evidence that, that it is important for, for schools to have the autonomy to set various things like exams and, and other things. What, what, do, you, what do you think about I think this trade-off? I think determining the, the right level of school autonomy is, uh, is the most important thing. Uh, and that partly turns on what principals feel they're able to do. Uh, if you've got a principal who is comfortable uh, managing uh, the lawn mowing contracts and wants the flexibility mm. to save money on lawn mowing so they can spend it on, on textbooks, then that's fine. But if you've got a principal who, print, who mainly wants to be an educational leader and actually mm. doesn't want to spend a lot of their time uh, working out how the budget's going to look, then you don't want to thrust upon that principal uh, more autonomy than they're ready to handle. Uh, so I think this is one of those areas where uh, the people who become principals uh, are important to thinking about the autonomy we should give them. Okay. Let's, let's just move to tertiary education because mm. uh, uh, there are similar themes that apply. Um, you have a, a study, uh, if I'm uh, correct, in two th from 2007 where you look at the various uh, returns to education. And, and, and specifically regarding tertiary education, you find that there's a, there's a high personal benefit, something in the order of 15% increase in salary uh, for every year of uh, tertiary yes. education. Um, now, uh, it, in regards to that, there's a recent uh, Grayton Institute report that is making the very same kind of um, uh, reporting the same findings and they argue based on that that we can actually start reducing the educational subsidies because students are basically getting all the all the private benefits so we don't need subsidies. What's your view on this? So clearly the private benefits are, are very large. Uh, as you said, 15% a year, so a three-year bachelor's degree is, is earning a student something in the order of uh, up to 50% increase in, uh, in earnings. Uh, and most of that is through productivity. Then the question is how much uh, are the uh, private returns also matched by social returns? And uh, uh, sadly, the social returns are easier to list than they are to measure. So you can list returns such as better productivity, so 
Uh, if you have more education and we're sitting next to one another mm. and adjoining cubicles, I might learn a lot from you and become more productive. Uh, higher education might also mean that you place, uh, le have less of an impact on the healthcare system. Uh, it's probably unlikely to have much of an impact on crime. Uh, increased secondary schooling, I think, could well have social payoffs in crime. I'm less sure about mm -hmm. universities. And there might be political uh, participation payoffs, of which I think we're fairly uncertain. Mm. Uh, so all of that adds up to, to, I think, big confidence intervals around what the social payoff to education is. The Grattan Institute report seems to take a very strongly rational view on, on debt. It seems to say we can ramp up uh, student contributions without affecting uh, equity outcomes. Uh, but what I worry about is that there might be some degree of, uh, of, of debt, debt aversion which, even if it isn't backed up by a rational model, could still lead uh, kids from disadvantaged backgrounds to balk at a, at a high sticker price and to, to refuse to take on a university education that would be good for them and would have big social payoffs. But I mean, I think the, the report uh, does a pretty good job trying to present evidence that people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds would not be disadvantaged and it wouldn't impact too much on their you know, on their uh, actually entering university. And, and there's also international uh, evidence uh, to that effect. So, um, but so you're, still, you're still worried that, that that could occur. But they're testing out of sample, Jan. So mm. the, the two best experiments we have are the ones that Bruce Chapman and Chris Ryan look at. The introduction of HEX and then the introduction of differential HEX in the late 1990s, which sees higher, higher HEX bills again. Um, but th those increases are of a much smaller magnitude than is proposed in the Grattan Institute report. Uh, so students, you know, now may be, may be asked at the end of their uh, university education to pay back a debt equivalent to, uh, to a small car. I don't think that then tells us that we could increase their debt to be enough to pay off a small plane uh, and they wouldn't balk at it. Okay. Um, let's, let's move to other microeconomic policies. Uh, you were quite instrumental in your research in, in highlighting the fact that, uh, that some government policies, if, if badly implemented, can have um, severe distortionary effect mm, on, mm. on people's behaviour. And, and the study that pops into my mind is your 2006 study, I think, with Joshua Gantz, where you look at the baby bonus, the introduction of the baby bonus and the timing of uh, births. Can you tell us a little bit what, what it was about um. Sure. So the, uh, the baby bonus study centres around a policy change put in place by the Howard government where they said any baby born on or after the 1st of July will receive $3,000. Uh, and they were asked, what about a baby born uh, on the evening of the 30th of June? And the minister was very clear that such a family would not receive the baby bonus. And there were rumours around this time that uh, this had caused uh, shifting of births and overcrowding in maternity wards. Uh, Joshua was very close to the issue because uh, his wife had one of their children uh, in uh, the July just after the baby bonus came into effect. Was he one of those and, that was moved? Uh, uh, well, he, he, they had some difficulty uh, getting, a, getting a, uh, a, an obstetrician at the time. Uh, and that's indeed what we find from the data. This is one of those studies where uh, you actually don't need much fancy econometrics. Uh, there is one day in Australia in which more babies were born than any other day in Australian history, and that's the first day the baby bonus was introduced. Mm. You just see the, spi the graph spike up, uh, and then what's troubling is that you see uh, the birth rate higher even in the second week of July uh, than, uh, than it should mm. have been, suggesting that uh, of the thousand births that were shifted from June into July, uh, a non-trivial share, maybe a few hundred, were shifted by a couple of weeks. And generally when we're thinking about the health of babies, we're worried about premature births. Mm -hmm. But there's also some evidence mm -hmm. that uh, babies that are in the womb uh, well past term uh, might suffer health, health consequences as well. So while we didn't find anything uh, that was conclusive, we were concerned that the sharp introduction of the baby bonus had actually had adverse health consequences. And you basically warned against this, but then there was another, you know, step increase in the, in the level of the baby bonus, I think twice, 
and the same thing happened, although the spike was a little bit That's low. right, yes. So the, uh, the Howard government then went and increased the baby bonus. So having introduced it into July 2004, increased it in July 2006. And just in case you'd thought the first result was a fluke, we saw the same mm. effect in, uh, in July 2006 again. Uh, and we had released our study uh, just prior to that in order to mm. try and persuade the government to just step in the, uh, the, the change. Mm. Uh, they didn't, and you again saw birth shifting. So, so you're basically now kind of moving into the, uh, the question of how we can uh, improve the design mm. of, of policies to avoid these kind of distortionary outcomes. So yeah, I think we want to think about introduction effects is what Joshua and I call it. And so normally when we think about policy distortions, we think about the steady state effect of a policy. I think we ought, ought to also make sure that when a policy is put into place, it doesn't generate perverse incentives uh, and, uh, and, and that those introduction effects are not as critical as the, the enduring effects, but, but they matter. Mm. Um, and there's simple ways to get around it. So, for example, uh, the, uh, the health minister wrote to obstetricians prior to uh, Labor's increase of the baby bonus to make them aware that there had been birth shifting previously and to encourage them to make sure that birth timing was only done uh, with the health of the baby and the mother in, in mind. <laughs> uh, I hope that had some effect in reducing the degree of birth shifting it, afterwards. It, it's, it, it's peculiar because I mean the government could easily change the policy but instead they're, they're going to write an email to uh, you know all, all those obstetricians uh, asking them to do something rather than actually changing the policy. But, but let's, uh, so far we've assumed that the baby bonus was actually a good policy, but but is it the case? Is it really the case? Do you think that that's something that's uh, desirable? Uh, well, the best argument you can make for the baby bonus is that if families are credit constrained at the time of the birth, uh, then this provides extra liquidity uh, for fa families at the time when the baby is born, and that any uh, drop in expenditure at the time of the birth could have substantially adverse consequences. So, you know, think about a, fa a family that has uh, difficulty keeping the heat on, providing enough food, uh, making sure that the parents uh, are, are in, in good harmony. If you can stop there being shouting in the household mm. at the, in the first uh, few months of a baby's life, mm. you might well improve the, uh, the, the, ch the child's life overall. But this, uh, this effect's kind of reduced now that there's not a one-off bonus, but it's actually phased out over time. It's paid fortnightly, I think. So uh, that's, that's probably not going to be very helpful to a credit constraint uh, family. But, but so, well, so my initial... Why so? I mean, it just means that, uh, that the, the family then has payments that they, they receive uh, through the ensuing six months or so, either through a baby bonus mm. or paid parental leave. I would have thought potentially that's even better for liquidity constraints if you're worried that uh, a lump of cash might not be mm. spent entirely on, on baby-related things. Mm. Okay. Now, in, in terms of baby bonus, I mean, the original assumption, at least on my part, was that it's trying to do something with the undesirable uh, demographic trends, the, the fact that the, the populations are, are ageing in Australia as well as in, in other advanced countries. So that's, that's not the intention, you think, uh, trying to kind of provide extra incentives for people to have kids? Uh. I mean, I think it was always principally income support, uh, trying to top up payments at, uh, at, at around the time of the birth. To the extent that it was a birth incentive, I think that was given life by then Treasurer Peter Costello's statement to radio on budget night that mums and dads should have uh, one for him, one for her and one for the country. Uh, and, uh, and, and that, I think, is probably a pretty weak argument for the baby mm. bonus. Mm. Uh, Joshua and I didn't look at it, but there's a Melbourne Institute study by Mark Wooden and co-authors that estimates uh, that for every extra uh, baby born thanks to the baby bonus, the cost to the budget is, is over $100,000. Mm. So, you know, talking about the, the demographic trends, uh, are there any other policies that you can think of that can be maybe implemented or, or reformed to try to cater for the fact that uh, when baby boomers retire, it's going to have a pretty big impact, negative impact on the on the budget? Um, 
can you think of any policies that should be implemented? Yeah. So the aged care reforms that are going on at the moment are, are aimed at a lot of that. Uh, one of the things that we uh, just announced yesterday, which I think is quite clever, is thinking about training of aged care workers. At the moment we train aged care workers and doctors very differently. Doctors are trained in teaching hospitals uh, which have sort of uh, regimented curriculum programs and experienced doctors to mentor them. Aged care workers tend to just find themselves in whatever aged care home they work in. So we're actually setting up teaching aged care centres to try and improve uh, the, quality, the quality of care. Um, and try also to think about uh, the way in which aged care is financed, I think is also important. Yeah, because so this is only going to kind of impose uh, more expenditure on the budget. It's not actually going to help solve the situation. Well, it is. imposes more expenditure on Australians as a whole. Uh, and I think one of the th ways in which you've seen the debate shift in the last 15 years uh, is away from the notion that government ought to pay for everything to the notion that uh, if uh, an, an elderly couple finds themselves in a situation where they have substantial assets and they want a better quality of, uh, of aged care, it might be appropriate to ask them to pay for it. Because, you know, really who's ending up paying for it is the children who are receiving slightly smaller inheritances while their parent receives a better quality of aged care. I think that conversation's gotten better in Australia than it was in the, in the, in the 1990s and mm. structuring sort of appropriate bonds, uh, protections around reverse mortgages to make sure reverse mortgages can work. You know, these are, these are natural policies to economists to make sure that the tax system doesn't generate perverse incentives uh, not to make a contribution uh, for those who can afford it to getting better quality aged care. Look, I, I think the extent of the demographic problem is, is much bigger than, than even most people realise. I mean, if you, if you look at the uh, projections over the next 25 years, the, the proportion of, of uh, people over 65 in Australia is going to increase by about 50% from about 0.2 to, to maybe 0.35, something in the uh, yeah to about 0.35. So it's a, it's a major impact and it's not only on the you know, pension scheme. Australia has done a, a pension reform, which is which has been copied by many other countries. Mm. But but it's it's mainly healthcare. I mean, most of the expenditure occurs in the last year or two of life. So we've we had you know 50 percent more more aged people. Uh, that that's going to have a, a severe impact on the on the healthcare uh, budget. And but I think one of the good things that economists have brought to this debate, Jan, is the notion that we ought to not just think of a 64-year-old as a 64-year-old. In, in mm. some sense, you know, as Paul McCartney actually said uh, when he turned 64, uh, it's quite different from what he thought it would be. <laughs> and you see this. David Cutler has some nice work where he looks at the functional physical mobility of a uh, somebody in the, who is 64 now and somebody who was 64 a generation ago uh, and you're finding increases in the order of about uh, 10 years and so uh, today's 64 year old uh, is as mobile as a 54 year old a, uh, mm. a generation ago uh, and so that means people enjoy longer lifespans and another thing I think the demographers miss is that uh, demographers often ignore price effects uh, and as prices, prices change you'll also see uh, demands change as well. So mm. I worry that a little bit too much of this modelling is, is driven by simple age structure and not enough by the way in which we would think about it as economists with the prices included. Okay. Let's, let's move on to a different microeconomic policy. Um, which regards the minimum wage legislation. You have a 2007 study where, you, where you're trying to assess to, to whom uh, the, the minimum uh, wage actually goes, mm. who's the earner. And surprisingly, to some people, you find that it's actually not a, the low income families, but it's, it's, the, it's the medium income families. And when you run the simulations, the, the scenario that I found most realistic uh, is actually going to lead to, a, to an increase in income inequality rather than a decrease. So, you know, we think of minimum wages as a wage as a, as a way to to reduce poverty and 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 uh, reduce inequality, but it seems your your research would imply that that's actually a bad idea. So, as a, as a as a politician now, would you uh, where do you see the minimum wage legislation? Uh, so, I find the minimum wage debate enormously frustrating. Uh, there's one side of the debate that doesn't acknowledge that there's benefits in terms of earnings to raising the minimum wage. 
and there's another side of the you debate. Mean income income effects, or yeah, that there's you know you raise the, raise the minimum wage, a bunch of people get wage rises, uh, and while uh, they're not all poor, they are disproportionately poor. And then there's another group of people that don't accept that there could be any disemployment effects. Uh, and I think both of those extreme cases don't make much sense. I think there's disemployment effects. I think they're probably fairly small. I think there's also positive wage effects, although it actually turns out we have no studies in Australia looking at what the wage effect is uh, and understanding better how much of a minimum wage increase flows through into, uh, into wage packets is, is really important. Uh, you know, you can write theoretical models in which the answer is none mm. uh, or in which the answer is all. Um, therefore, theory tells us nothing and we'd like to have some more empirics. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it is part of, a, of, of an anti-poverty toolkit, uh, but I think it's, uh, it'll, it'll never, never be the only effective part of alleviating poverty. Uh, things like uh, uh, earned income tax credits, uh, focusing on the impact of payroll taxes and income taxes, uh, mm. and of course uh, education are all going to be at least as important in fighting poverty as the minimum wage. Now you have you have a very interesting study, uh, I think, with um, uh, just remind me with uh, oh, about f uh, predicting. Uh, uh, ah, with Justin Wolfers. Uh, Justin Wolfers, yeah, yes. about forecasting uh, yes. election outcomes. <laughs> and uh, one of the things you do, you compare economic models, you compare the, the polls, and mm. you compare uh, prediction markets. And the interesting finding to some people is that you actually uh, find the prediction markets to uh, very often give you a better answer than, than the polls. So as a, now as a politician, are you kind of, is, is your party uh, uh, paying more attention to prediction markets? Uh, yeah, so you always learn good things from co-authors. Uh, with the baby bonus study, I was sure when we began it that we wouldn't find any effects. And with the uh, election forecasting paper, I said, Justin, why do you want to include this prediction market stuff? Isn't it more interesting just to look at the economic models and the polls? Uh, and then he persuaded me that prediction markets were, were truly fascinating to look at. Um, I certainly look at them, but there's a, a large degree of path dependence uh, in politics. Uh, that's true in the commentariat. Uh, that's also true uh, within uh, political parties themselves. And so, you know, I think the the, the temptation to continue uh, surveying in the kind of uh, mid 20th century way is going to be with us uh, for quite a quite a time to come despite the fact that it is so extraordinarily volatile. I mean, mm. you and I know if, you've, if you're measuring something that has uh, a, a, a margin of error of a couple of percentage points either way, and you want to look at the change in that thing, then if two things measured with a two, two percentage point margin, margin of error uh, differ by two percentage points, then chances are you're just looking at noise. Mm, yeah. um, but that's not the impression you'd get if you looked at the front of uh, a major broadsheet on the day they brought out their in-house poll. Mm. Let, me, let me ask you about the influence um, of academic research and you know, yeah. your personal research on, on your personal life. So far we've looked at policy, but yes. uh, you have an interesting study where you look at how uh, divorce rates and, and generally happiness, how, it, how it's affected by the composition of children. Mm. And you find that that if, uh, if people have a boy and a girl, they, they are less likely uh, to get divorced. So given that your first child was a boy, I think I can disclose that. Uh, um, Absolutely. Were, were you wishing for a girl as, as the second uh, child? Uh, uh, so this is what uh, economists would call having convex preferences over child gender. Um, you, can, uh, you can tell models in which uh, people ought to uh, enjoy having two children of the same kind, for example, because they can pass down the, the blue clothes or the pink clothes to the next child. But in general, you see uh, convex preferences. So, uh, you know, this is partly exhibited in the fact that parents with two kids of the same gender are more likely to go for a third than parents of two kids of the same, uh, of, of different genders. Um, my research also showed they were more likely to split up, uh, not by a great deal, but uh, 1.7 percentage points, which is, uh, you know, ac accounts for uh, maybe a 30th of the total variation mm -hmm. uh, in marriage, marriage rates among those families. 
Um, but uh, I don't know whether this is because we've talked ourselves into it or whether it was always our preferences. Uh, we're delighted by the fact that we're expecting a third boy. Uh, oh. I feel like I, uh, I know how to raise boys. I feel as though uh, I know what sort of holidays we'll have. They're going to be uh, uh, active holidays in which we try and all exhaust one another and, uh, and I feel as though I know what kinds of uh, empirical lessons I'll be sitting down to teach my sons and making sure that by the time they turn 10 they understand the fallacy of the sunk cost and they can think at the margin. <laughs> um, well, congratulations very much. Uh, Thank you. And I have to say that your wife is due in about a week or so. Which yes. Is exactly yes. the reason why we have to pack up now because uh, you're catching a plane in about an hour. So uh, we uh, would like to thank you very much for joining thank us you. Uh, and for your ongoing efforts to contribute to uh, public policy, not only in Australia but worldwide. So good luck for the birth uh, to you and your wife and, and we're looking forward to more of your ideas. And if things don't work out for you in politics, we'd be very happy to have you back on the <laughs> academic circuit. Thank you very, thank you very much. Okay, I think this may you, be Andrew. an absorbing state, uh, but I very much enjoy dabbling in, uh, in economics and I think the popularisation of economics is enormously valuable uh, and, and important to the future of, uh, of our discipline. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thank you. Take care.